my name is Nicole Sullivan. Um, I'm here to talk about design fast websites. Um, this is a reprise of the talk that I did for the front end summit a few months ago. Um, the sort of general subject topic is don't blame the rounded corners. Uh, a lot of times uh, I have consulted with, um, with sites which have performance problems, obviously, and um, the first thing that almost always comes up is, oh, what about those rounded corners? It's got to be the rounded corners. Um, and actually, sometimes rounded corners are responsible for, um, for performance problems, and we'll get into that a little bit later, of the ways that rounded corners can cause difficulties. Um, but in a lot of cases, they're actually a really light way to add visual interest to a site, um, assuming that as web devs, we did our job correctly and we built the modules uh, in a reasonable way. Um, so the first bit to talk about is, is our users. Um, for me, uh, working on performance is all about making users happy. It's going back to what's best for our users. And I think this is the common point that is shared between, especially between web devs and design. And it's the point on which we can sort of link our work uh, with designers and uh, make performance uh, an important part of both domains. Um, users do care if sites are fast. And I'll give you some stats in a few minutes that will get into why that's true and why I believe that's true. Um, but first, I can't give you the solution. I'm not a designer. I can't tell you what a site should look like. But I can actually um, make it more clear uh, what the constraints of the problem are. Um, and that can help um, to define the design and de define what's acceptable um, for a commercial website. And, and also define where the limits are and, and what shouldn't be, shouldn't be done. So let's start off with why talk about it. Why do we even care about performance? Um, first bit is because fast is absolutely better. Um, users have a lot of choice now. So uh, once upon a time, there weren't that many um, options out there on the web, right? I think we all remember when the first sort of Web 2.0 apps came out. And basically, uh, I think one of them that I liked was uh, list items. And so you could reorder the list items. And it was like, wow oh my goodness, you can change the order of my to-do lists or whatever. And um, you know, at the time, it was a big wow, and it was really kind of groundbreaking. But now, if somebody did that, they'd just say, ah, whatever. You know, that's, that's no big deal. Um, so we need to focus on performance, because if the user has a choice between two sites which offer more or less the same functionality, um, but one of them is faster, they're going to go to the one that's faster. Um, the other reason is because sites are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, modern websites have changed architecturally. Um, when we look at some stats about uh, average page size and also about the number of HTTP requests, we can see that it's going up exponentially. Um, from 2003 to 2008, we went from 97K to 312K in the average, uh, average website. Um, we also doubled the number of HTTP requests, the number of objects in the page. So that would be images or flash or anything else, um, up to almost 50. If we look even just over the last 12 months, um, we can see that the size of sites is going up here as well, from 250 to 310K. So we're kind of fighting this exponential increase in, in the stuff we're packing into pages. Um, so we have to be constantly vigilant about performance in order to make that balance. Um, I think another important point to keep in, keep in mind is that uh, more and more users are blurring um, the difference between web apps and the apps that they have on their desktop. So uh, I think your average user doesn't necessarily even think of uh, the latest web app, Web 2.0 kind, of, uh, kind of app, as being different than something they've got on their desktop, which means they expect super snappy response. They expect all the data to be already there. Um, these are things that uh, aren't always true in the case of a web app. But if we take into account that our users don't know they're on a web app, um, then we are pushed even further to um, uh, basically to come up with something excellent and fast and cool, right? Um, so the third reason is that time is money. Um, question, uh, we, originally there were, there were few companies that were interested in um, doing performance research, but now uh, more and more are, which is great because we're getting to see this sort of cross um, uh, cross-company information about how performance is, is impactful of user behavior. Um, so one of these tests added 100 milliseconds to a web page. Um, and I think when I first saw that, I thought 100 milliseconds, that's, that's nothing. There's no way that impacts uh, response time. There's just, that can't, that can't impact anything. 
Uh, but what Amazon saw in their test is that it caused a 1% drop in sales. So when we start thinking that even these really tiny changes in response time uh, can have a, a serious impact not only on user behavior but, but also on, um, on you know, revenue in the bottom line, then I think uh, these are the, some of the ways that we can start making the argument to both designers who care about users and product who cares an awful lot about, uh, about um, sales and revenue that performance matters to all three of us and, and those three groups together can do a better job. So the next one was to add 400 milliseconds to a website. Um, we can start thinking 400 milliseconds, that's almost a half second. Maybe that would have more impact. Um, and in fact, Yahoo did a test. Um, I believe it was on front page and autos. And um, what they found is that uh, uh, just this small 400 millisecond addition to response time caused a 5 to 9% drop in full page traffic. Um, for people who don't understand, full page traffic is a measure of abandonment. So um, basically, abandonment was when a user just gets fed up with your site. They have waited long enough. They are not going to stay anymore. They're going to press the back button or go to another site. They don't even stay long enough to wait until the onload event of your page. Um, so it's really the worst case scenario. It's a user that's just said, I'm done. I'm out of here. Um, so adding just 400 milliseconds um, can impact the number of users that are, are, that are getting that sort of worst case scenario um, uh, user experience. So adding 500 milliseconds. So this is where most people start to think that, uh, that response time is gonna be important. Um, around a half second they imagine, yeah, that sounds like something I could notice. Um, and what Google found was that just adding 500 milliseconds to a website uh, caused 20% fewer searches. Uh, so this is really big. Users really care about performance. Um, and, and given that knowledge, we can start to look at ways that, um, that we can uh, change the design to improve the user experience and improve performance. So we've got a lot of information, uh, ideas, tidbits, uh, best practices for design. Um, some of them are more difficult to implement, some of them are, are easier, but we'll go through and, and talk about all of them. First, I want to talk about sort of my philosophy of being a web dev. Um, Sometimes there's a little bit of, of um, conflict, I guess, between designers and front-end developers. We, we um, work on the same stuff, and, and it's not always clear where the line between the two is drawn. Um, but for me, I look at it as sort of working out of respect for the design, that um, basically it's my job to create something um, in code, but I want it to be as beautiful on the inside as it is on the outside. Um, any one of us can code something, which is really amazing, right, with some sort of tabs or something, who knows what, that we did in five lines of code and it's amazing and it's so elegant and beautiful, but the vast majority of our users are never, ever, ever going to view source or certainly view the CSS and they'll never know just how beautiful our code was. But what they do recognize is beautiful design. And so working with designers, we actually make the code um, beautiful on the outside and clever as well. Um, also, I think it's important that as web devs, we respect the original design vision. Uh, design teams are also um, diverse, right? There may be five people or 10 people or uh, maybe even 50 working on the same site. Um, each one of them has different ideas, different vision of the global, the global, global project. Um, they may not be aware of everything that is done by the others. So as web devs, we can kind of give the pushback and say, um, wait a minute, this module kind of exists already, or had you not seen this other person in your team design something really similar, or you know, we already have something that addresses uh, um, a list of actions that you can take. So maybe we don't need two lists that, that do that. Um, so basically, consistent design is going to help code stay clean. Um, if design is all over the place, the code is almost certainly going to be all over the place. It's, it's a sort of partnership to make a fast site. So these are the nine best practices. Um, I'm going to get into each of them individually, so I won't, I won't go into every single one of them right now. The first is to create a component library of smart objects. Um, the way that I look at a website is almost like little Legos. Um, you want to basically make interesting bits of your site, interesting HTML, CSS objects, which can be mixed and matched in order to create pages. Um, you want to create sort of building blocks of sites um, rather, than, um, rather than creating each thing as an individual element. Before, uh, when CSS was used widely, basically each page was kind of an island unto itself. Um, and each page you could do anything you wanted in it because it had no impact on any other page in the site and 
there was no sort of limitation on, on um, what could be done. Uh, then CSS came along and we started building modules. And each module is an island unto itself and each one behaves completely and independently. And um, as you add complexity to the site, you add your CSS file, it grows and grows and grows and grows because these modules don't share anything. Um, basically what I'm suggesting is we step it back again and we start thinking about what are the objects in our page? Um, what are the basic building blocks of our page? Um, so some of the things that I think of as these Legos or, or, um, or objects are headings, lists, um, module headers and footers, um, grids, buttons, um, anything else that should be consistent site-wide. So um, if we start breaking things down not by um, exactly which module behaves in which way, but instead you know, we have different components that serve different purposes in the site, we can start to get a lot less code and a lot more out of it, kind of one-to-many relationship between the code we write and the potential um, look and feel that we can get from that code. So reusing elements makes them performance freebies. Uh, this is important to keep in mind because um, if we have a list already in the page and we've already called it and we use that list again, it's a completely free element. It has no performance impact for the most part. Um, the reason for that is that we've already got the image in cache. We've already uh, downloaded the CSS that's necessary. If there was some um, f functionality associated with it, the JavaScript is already in place for it. So using it again makes it a complete freebie in terms of uh, the performance cost. It's super important to de design the Legos first. Um, we, if we want to move to a point where we're designing objects, we can't be designing pages and we can't be designing modules. We really have to move back to designing the most basic objects, your headings, your lists, your really basic stuff first. And only when that's done can we design uh, modules, containers, things like that. When that's done, then we can use those components to build pages. Uh, but if we design each page kind of individually, it's really hard to get that, that performance benefit. Um, one important thing to, to be aware of is avoiding redundancy. Um, these three rounded corner boxes did, I think maybe still do, exist on a real live site out there. Um, and they're incredibly similar. Um, I think that users are more and more sophisticated, but they're not that sophisticated. Um, I have a hard time even seeing the difference between them unless I'm on a really great screen. Um, we need to sort of look at modules when we're adding stuff to our site and say, wait a minute, no, that already exists. You know, we're not going to do that again um, in a, you know, I think the one on the right has a two pixel shadow and the one on the left has a three pixel shadow. Um, both, you know, one pixel gray rounded corner boxes. So we have to look at stuff like that and say, and say no and give pushback. Another one is headings. So Headings three and five here are too similar. I would even argue that headings four and six are too similar. And this is an actual site I worked on. So this is a, you know, something I got back from the designer and this is how, how they wanted it. Basically, I think some of the headings are bold and the other ones are bigger. And so it's really unclear which ones are more important. Um, and also they're just, they're just too similar to, to exist in the same site. The rule of thumb that I use is that if two modules look too similar to include on the same page, then they're too similar to include on the same site. You need to choose one. Um, if you wouldn't put them side by side, then they shouldn't exist on you know, some uh, sub page and also on the home page. They should be uh, uh, choosing one of the two. Uh, the second rule is to use consistent semantic styles. Um, Basically, a heading should not become a heading uh, in another part of the page. What do I mean? What I mean is that because we're designing modules at this point, we're not designing objects, those little objects behave completely differently depending on where in the page they find themselves. So when I'm going to a new site that I haven't worked on before, that had its CSS built by somebody else, uh, the first thing I do is do a tour of the site, see what exists already, and then try to reuse those components when I'm building pages out for that site. Um, but what happens the first time I grab, oh, I find the heading, it's perfect, it's big, it's green, it's exactly what I'm looking for, um, and I pop that heading into my module, and all of a sudden it's tiny and blue and behaves completely differently. Um, maybe I'll try again a couple of times, but pretty soon I'm going to give up because I won't trust the CSS, and I won't trust that the objects are consistent, and so every time I want to do something new or different in the site, I'm just going to re rewrite my code again and again and again, um, which means that 
with time, the size of the CSS file for the site will just grow and grow and grow. The more modules, the more pages, um, it will be completely proportional to your, uh, your CSS file size. Whereas if we pull back a step and we try to get that consistent semantic behavior for objects, um, then, uh, then I think people will be more likely to reuse code and, and get the performance benefit from that. Um, some of the, uh, the types of objects that I think should be consistent site-wide are lists. Um, I think that often lists convey the same, can convey a similar meaning. So there may be a list uh, which serves to uh, let the user know that it's a bunch of actions they can choose from. Um, maybe there's on-page links which have little down arrows or something like that. Um, there could also just be your simple basic list uh, that is your default type of list if you're, you know, if you're choosing, uh, you know, an, um, an unordered list. That sort of thing. Those should be consistent site-wide. Um, action list in one module should not look completely different than an action list in another module, um, both for performance reasons and also because our users would prefer that they can sort of get their bearings in the site and then consistently be able to predict how the, how the site will behave. So consistency. Um, rewriting rules to overwrite rules that overwrite rules that overwrite rules is really dangerous in terms of the performance of the site. Um, a lot of sites will be extremely high performance on day zero when they launch and then day 30 or 60 or 90 or you know it could be a couple years they're a, a total mess. Um, basically a heading should behave predictably no matter where you put it and other objects should also. So how about a real life example? Um, this is from personal finance on the Yahoo site. Um, and there are some good things here, and there are some things that are less optimal. Um, so the first one is that there are two different tab styles on the page. Um, maybe that's normal because the upper tabs do seem to be navigation, and the tabs on the right are um, tabs in a particular module. But maybe it's not normal. You know, maybe tabs on a site should all look more or less the same. Um, another one is you know having different contour blocks, which are essentially the same. Uh, but don't um, uh, but don't use the same images. So if you have uh, if you have a rounded corner box and um, well, it's basically the example that I showed before. We have three different rounded corner boxes. Each of them um, has a slightly different shadow or outline, uh, but not different enough that a user can tell the difference between them. And yet they all call different images and different HTTP requests. And if they haven't been sprited, it's even a bigger performance penalty. On the other hand, there's a couple things that are done really well here. Um, changes in width or in the background image of a module shouldn't necessarily mean that you need to use different images or a different module. Um, there's no reason you can't combine um, uh, one contour with different backgrounds to get uh, a lot more look and feel with uh, a lower performance cost. And that's what they've done here. Uh, these three blocks on the side are all uh, using the same, um, the same rounded corners, and yet there's one which is wider, there's one which is sort of standard, and there's another that's using um, the, uh, a particular background image. OK, so the third one is to design modules to be transparent on the inside. This is super important because it, it's one of the key things that can get us a sort of one-to-many relationship between the amount of CSS we write and the number of outputs or visual look and feel, diversity, interest in, in our site. Uh, what does it do? Basically, if we separate our contour blocks from our background blocks, from all of the little content objects that we have in our page, our tabs, our headers, our lists, our paragraphs, um, then we get this many contours times this many backgrounds times that many um, uh, content objects, sort of visual look and feel and diversity. If we combine that with using grids, then we can build whole sites using some basic building blocks without sort of reinventing the wheel every time we come up with something new. So why is, the, why is it transparent on the inside important? It's because as long as we're linking our contour um, with our um, background color, then you're going to have to have um, the number of images to do those corners times the number of backgrounds and the number of, of contour colors that you have. So you're, as your site increases in complexity, uh, the number of HTTP requests goes up uh, proportionally. Whereas if we separate the two, we get that kind of one-to-many uh, relationship. Um, now, a lot of people know about the, um, 
uh, the uh, List Apart article that talks about uh, mountaintop corners. I think it's a, it's a really good one. Um, and I think we can take it even further um, because we can, um, using careful choice of pixels, really separate out that, uh, the contour and the background color from, um, uh, from each other and get that one-to-many relationship. Uh, we can also consider using PNG8 for progressive enhancement, and that's something that I'll tell you more about. There are a few cases where it gets hard, right? It gets difficult to do that, and that is when our modules fall on gradients and when they fall on, um, you know, pictures or, you know, any kind of variable background. Um, so that might be the point when you, we push back on the designer and we say, yes, you can do this, we can build it, it's not a question of it being possible, but this is the cost and this is how the user is going to perceive that cost. Um, the fourth rule is to optimize sprites and images. Um, the general feeling about sprites has been that we should just put everything possible together and um, that works really well for sites that have very few pages, but it doesn't work well at all for anyone else. Um, basically, my way of looking at this is that you can have a large number of pages, you can have reasonable maintenance cost, and you can have a super optimized sprite with everything in the kitchen sink in one sprite. Um, so you can pick two of these, but you can't have all three. Um, so what you have to decide is where does your site fall into this sort of continuum. Um, if it's a search property, search results page, um, that kind of thing, you've got, you know, one or two pages. So you can afford to have that super optimized sprite um, and your maintenance costs will stay reasonable because you just only have a limited number of pages. On the other hand, if it's a more diverse site, I, I, one of the sites that I worked on, I think at six months of life had maybe 1,500 different unique pages. Um, part of this is because it was built by uh, lots of different groups. Uh, we basically delivered a CSS and then they built HTML pages without us having any sort of vision of how they were using our CSS afterwards. Also because there was a CMS and so um, content producers could go in and they could put these modules together in, in any way they liked. Um, when you have um, that many pages, you can't sprite absolutely everything together or your maintenance will go through the roof. Um, so the first question is number of pages you have, um, how modular is your site, and how much time can you spend on maintenance? And that will help you figure out um, what you should sprite together and what you shouldn't. Um, if you fall on the more pages side, you need to do kind of object-oriented spriting, which means you sprite together background images that actually go together. So if you have one rounded corner um, module, you would sprite the, the corners together into one and, and you get a performance improvement from that. But you wouldn't necessarily sprite that sprite together with the other sprites that do all the rounded corners from the other modules. That way, later on, as the site evolves, we say, oh, you know, that module, we don't want it anymore. Throw it away. All you do is delete the CSS that belongs to that object and delete that one sprite and you're done. Uh, whereas I see a lot of cases over time where a sprite sort of builds up cruft. It's got all these images and nobody's exactly sure how any of them are being used anymore. Um, and, and doing a little bit of object-oriented spriting if the site has more pages will help to sort of contain that. So there are also nine ways that you can optimize um, images and uh, sprites. The first is to combine like colors. Um, anytime you have, uh, you can stay under this sort of 256 uh, color range, you can often get a big uh, uh, difference in size of the images. Uh, the next is to avoid white space, particularly for mobile. Uh, we don't want to have a lot of extra white space hanging around in the sprite. I know it can be more convenient in terms of building the sprite, in terms of uh, maintaining the CSS and some of the adaptability of font size and that kind of thing. Um, but if your site is also being viewed with mobile, especially it's important to think about removing that white space. Um, horizontal can be better than vertical uh, for image optimizations. Uh, another is just to limit the colors. A lot of times we think we need so very many colors in an image, but in fact, uh, we can eliminate uh, a lot of them without a sort of visual difference in the image. Um, the next is to optimize the individual images and then sprite it. Um, so you may actually be able to take, you know, one little icon and reduce the number of colors in it and maybe rotate it slightly so you get less anti-aliased pixels or um, simplify the image a little bit. Think about what the user can actually see in the image versus what they can't. Um, and once that's fixed, and once you've fixed all the sort of individual, uh, individual icons and sprites that you're putting together, then you put them uh, in one larger image and then try optimizing the number of colors you have there. 
Uh, that will help you eliminate sort of automatic choice of, of which colors will be taken out that will maybe ruin one part of the sprite because it just didn't get enough sort of color depth. Um, so the sixth one is, yes, to reduce anti-aliased pixels. Uh, sometimes if you have a little icon and it's tilted ever so slightly, you know, it's not quite 90 degrees, it may not be a tilt that's visible to the user, uh, but it may be creating 15 anti-aliased pixels and uh, a lot of difficulty in terms of uh, the code. Um, the seventh is to avoid diagonal gradients. Obviously, diagonal gradients are the only kind that we can't repeat in any which way. Uh, if you have diagonal gradients, you just have to have a giant image in the page. Um, so that's something to avoid. Uh, the eighth one is to avoid alpha transparency. Um, basically, uh, IE6 can't deal with alpha transparency, and there are a lot of performance penalties with trying to force it to deal with it. So we want to um, avoid using alpha transparency as much as, as much as possible, and I'll get into some of the techniques for that. Uh, and the ninth is to change the gradient color every few pixels rather than every pixel. Uh, by default, if you, you know, grab a gradient in any of your image editing uh, tools, you're going to end up with a gradient that changes every single pixel. But if the two values, you're going from a light blue to a dark blue or, you know, from a white to a blue, don't, aren't so, so different, then often you can change every two or three pixels and the user can't actually see the difference in the, in the gradient that it produces. Um, I think uh, you have to be a little more careful if the two colors are really odd, but I'm not exactly sure why you'd take, for example, red and green and do a gradient between the two. But if you did, you probably couldn't change, um, couldn't change uh, as, as infrequently as that. Um, be careful with light, uh, logos. They're super recognizable. We see them all the time. We don't even keep, uh, we don't even really take into account how much we, we know logos. You know, I think children recognize um, fast food logos sooner than they do, you know, political figures. Um, so straight away, even small changes to logos will be recognized. If you're thinking about optimizing uh, a site's logo, it's really important to get a, an expert designer, someone who's going to be able to go in and make really careful choices. Um, try progressively enhanced PNG8. It's a really great way to avoid um, alpha filters. Um, basically, why is alpha image loader used? So IE6 doesn't natively support alpha transparency um, in PNG24. Um, using the alpha image loader will force that support, but it comes with a, a lot of different penalties. Um, first and foremost, it blocks, the, it blocks the rendering and it freezes the browser, um, and it increases memory consumption. The thing to keep in mind is that it's per element, not per image. So the alpha image uh, loader is recalculated basically uh, on every HTML element in the page that has the, uh, the background image applied to it. So that means that if you did, uh, for example, on your sprite, um, you used an alpha image loader to get you know, the nice alpha transparency, then um, say you use that sprite 20 times in the page, you're going to get that performance penalty times 20. Um, and so very quickly, even small amounts of, of performance penalty and blocking add up to a, a significant difference in user experience. So the best solution is just to avoid it completely. In a lot of cases we can. Um, we can be creative and we can find ways to get around needing uh, alpha transparency. Um, and using PNG8 uh, to create that progressive enhancement is a great way to do that. The fallback, if you absolutely must, use alpha transparency is to use uh, an underscore hack so that it will not be, um, it will not cause a penalty for the better IE browsers that actually do support alpha transparency. So progressively enhanced PNG8. Um, basically people think of PNG8, and there's a lot of misconceptions about it actually. Uh, people think of it as uh, basically GIF, that it's uh, a binary kind of transparency, either completely opaque or completely transparent, but it's not true. Uh, PNG8 can actually do alpha transparent pixels, um, and those are the sort of partially transparent pixels that might make the difference between your corner looking good and your corner looking really smooth and perfect, for example. So up here, if we look at this um, image from the Mountaintop Corners uh, article in a list apart, we could see on the right-hand side, no alpha transparency at all. Um, it's good. It would look fine. Uh, but if we could add those two extra pixels, and this is something designers will often ask for, the slightly, slightly opaque pixels there in that middle part that would give it the perfect, uh, perfectly smooth corner look, um, it would be better. So what we can do to do that is actually 
create first the image as a PNG8 with binary transparency, and that's going to be sort of the look on the right with either all on or all off. Then in Fireworks, we can go in, and there are a few other open source tools as well, um, we can go in and we can add in those couple of pixels that would be the difference between it, it looking really excellent. Um, another example, um, we can just decide that, for example, IE6 doesn't need the shadow. What if it could just get the, um, the nice border, you know, clean, rounded corner border. Um, this is a transparent on the outside example. And then all of the other browsers would get that nice shadow. Now, I'm not talking about having different images served to different browsers. I really don't like that. Um, anything that hurts maintenance is going to hurt performance. Because if it means that you have to go in and instead of editing one image, you have to edit three or four, um, straight away there's going to be a, a strong tendency um, to only edit the ones that are used by the, the market-leading browsers and not necessarily um, maintain the sort of performance of the site and, and keep a sort of similar user experience across browsers. Um, so yeah, for example, deciding that um, that, that slight uh, uh, shadow would be okay to not have in IE6 can be a great way to provide one image and one set of code to all the browsers, and yet because of this uh, functionality of PNG8, um, IE6 won't see that. Basically, IE6 is going to render any partially transparent pixels fully transparent, whereas the good browsers are going to render uh, partially transparent pixels as partially transparent. So that means you get that both, uh, both the default fallback version and the uh, excellent look and feel version uh, in one image. Uh, experimental data shows that using Alpha Image Loader uh, caused 100 milliseconds of slowness for Yahoo Search. Uh, this is really important, right? Straight away we think 100 milliseconds, that's nothing. But when we go back to looking at the Amazon data and seeing that 100 milliseconds was a 1% uh, difference in sales, we can start to say, okay, yeah, right. These design decisions really do impact the user experience, really can uh, make users happier with our products. And so uh, start to take that into account more. It's also important to crush images. Um, I think part of why image optimization hasn't been on the radar in the way it should is because it falls kind of straight in between that web dev world and that uh, sort of engineering world and the uh, design world. And so it's sort of nobody's baby. Uh, but I think everybody owns a part of it, actually. I think there are two basic decisions. The first is, what quality do I need? Um, what kind of uh, colors do I need? Is it uh, you know, a glossy image of uh, uh, Brad and Angelina Jolie on, on OMG? If it is, you probably need a really, really high quality uh, image because people are coming in order to see that glossy celeb photo. Um, if it's something else, you know, could we lower it? So these are the sorts of decisions that live squarely with designers. Um, they need to be helping to make the decisions about what's the right amount of quality um, given that users will suffer if we add unnecessary quality. Once that decision's been made, then I think there's an engineering effort to be taken into account. Um, basically, there are tons of tools that would do non-lossy compression. Um, and so as engineers, we can take an image that the quality choice has been made, and then we can run lots of different um, compression tools in order to figure out um, what is the absolute smallest image I can get while retaining this quality. So in breaking the, the sort of question of image optimization into these two parts, uh, we can pretty quickly see that both, uh, both engineers and designers have a role to play in, in image optimization. On the other hand, um, there are a ton of different open source algorithms tools out there to crush images, and it can take a lot of time to, uh, to actually crush those images. The reason being that um, for example, if we start off with Photoshop and we do a save for the web, and we have all kinds of choices about quality and image format and that kind of thing to make. Even having made those, we don't really know the final size of the image because um, we, after we run it through, for example, PNG crushing tools, that PNG, which before in Photoshop said it was going to be slightly larger, is, uh, is actually smaller. And so um, there are too many steps, basically. So what we decided was that this was a job for um, uh, for a machine and not for a human, and that basically we wanted to create a tool, uh, Stoyan Stefano Stefanov and I, that would um, 
that would essentially take your images, assuming you've made your quality choice, and then pass them through a whole bunch of different um, open source tools to optimize the quality. Then take the best result and give it back to you. It's a really simple tool, but it saves a lot of web dev time um, in image optimization. So what does it look like? Um, basically, uh, there's two parts. So you can, um, you can use the uploader or you can submit URLs and it will crush all of those images for you. Um, or there's a Firefox extension, which is actually really interesting because you can run it on any web page. It will grab all of the different images used to build that page and crush all of them and then give you a report of the results. So here, um, it's been run on a particular page. I think this might be part of the Obama campaign website. I'm not sure. They've made improvements, though, because previously when I ran it on their site, they had over 300K of, of image bloat. Um, anyway, so they... Uh, in running this tool, you can see that they were able to optimize uh, 21K off the size of the images used on their site. And then um, there's also a zip, which you can download all of the, all of the crushed images. The fifth rule, avoid non-standard browser fonts. Um, there's no way that putting um, text in images is going to be high performance. It's just not possible, especially now with more and more global sites that then need to be internationalized and translated to different languages. Uh, using fonts that don't work in browsers isn't, isn't a reasonable choice anymore. Um, I think that it can make sense as a highlight or as a, you know, a special thing every now and then in a graphic or something like that. But as a general choice for headings and, and buttons and things like that, we need to stay away from uh, non-standard browser fonts. It can also be perfectly acceptable in logos, clearly, to have non-standard fonts. Uh, the sixth rule is to use columns rather than rows. Um, this is something that's important because when you use rows, uh, a vertical alignment comes into play. And vertical alignment is something that's really difficult to do um, in a performant way with CSS. Uh, basically, there, there, is no, um, there is no solution to vertical alignment that makes me happy enough to endorse it um, with a CSS-only approach. Um, they all have drawbacks, either performance or maintenance. Um, and having a JavaScript vertical alignment does slow your page down. It's a lot of different DOM accesses to get, uh, to get everything aligned perfectly. So if we have the choice between designing a site that uh, works based on columns and designing a site that works based on rows, we should always sort of go with the, the column layout. The seventh rule is to choose your bling carefully. Um, every market is different. Um, different people in different places prefer a different web experience. So, uh, for example, users in Southeast Asia like bigger pages with more in it, flatter pages, so they don't want to have to click many, many times to get to the content that they're looking for. They want to find one big page with everything on it. Um, it also uh, is a sort of a market that prefers um, sort of more flashy images and more stuff going on in the page than I can personally um, uh, enjoy. So that means that when we're choosing what to put in sites and what not to put in them, we have to take into the account the market because the right choice made for a site that's primarily used in the US is not going to be the right choice for a site that's primarily used in France or primarily used in Japan. Um, each one of these places is going to have their own constraints um, in terms of uh, how much sort of bling and, and visual interest makes sense in that market. Um, it also makes sense to compare competitors. Um, if your competitor is giving a really, really rich, rich uh, visual experience, then um, you have to consider whether that is what the, the market wants as well. So the eighth rule is to be flexible. Um, think of things as being both extensible in height and in width. Um, basically, your grid should control your width. Um, no module should ever have a width associated with it. By default, when you plug a module into a, a spot on the page, um, it should take all the space that it can, and it should, uh, uh, it should take you know, sort of all the vit vertical, sorry, horizontal space that it can. Um, the content in that module should control the height. Um, so, for example, um, I wrote a, um, a box that had a header and you know, it was a really simple, basic shadow box, I think similar to some of the stuff we've seen already. And um, I was told uh, by the spec that I received that there would only ever, ever, ever be one line of uh, text in the header of this block. And what I said is, that's fine, but I'm not going to code it that way. 
I'm not going to say this header is 18 pixels exactly all the time ever, because in just leaving out that little bit of CSS, I took into account the fact that it could have more lines of text later. Um, and a few months down the road, the, um, the project manager added some modules that, had, that were FAQ modules, and they actually put the question in the header of the block and the answer in the block itself, which straight away meant that they had multiple lines. Um, this is the kind of thing where if we, if we think to the future and we don't just uh, code it so that it will look exactly right as it is now, but we think of leaving open the possibility of what it will look like later, um, then we'll get a higher performance um, site because we won't be doing that sort of coding over rules over rules over rules and exceptions. Um, the ninth rule is to learn to love grids. Um, this one is really important to me, actually. I think that there's no question that any, uh, any web dev out there can uh, code a, a grid system or can float something to the left and, and put some other content to the right of it. Everybody's capable of that. Everybody's also capable of creating you know, three-column layout, two-column layout. No, no question that we can, we can all do that. But when we use grids, what we're doing is we're, um, we're getting those performance freebies. We're saying, OK, we've written the ways that you can um, add columns or remove columns, the ways that you can break up your uh, content area of your page into different uh, sizes. And then we're reusing those over and over and over again, which means that we get that performance freebie every single time. Uh, instead of with each module saying, OK, I want this image to the left and this text to the right of it, we're saying, no, we have an object that takes care of the case where we have an image to the left and some content to the right that describes that image. OK, so I wanted to say thanks to uh, Nate Keckley, who um, listened to this presentation more times than is fair, um, and also to the Yahoo Exceptional Performance team, and to uh, Alista Part, and also to Tom Chi and Dee Adams, who are some UED folks who also uh, listen to me uh, um, go through these ideas in multiple revisions. Um, so let's keep talking about this. Um, I'm available on the web, Stubbornella, almost everywhere. Um, I'm also writing a book with Stoyan Stefanov uh, with O'Reilly about uh, image optimization. Um, and so look for that upcoming. It will also get into how to, um, how to build image optimization into, um, into your site so that it happens automatically and isn't a sort of after the fact uh, kind of uh, add-on. Okay.